Last week in the Dáil, when he was making his speech to propose the um, uh, election of Leo Varadkar as Taoiseach, the former Taoiseach, Enda Kenny, um, in the closing paragraph of, of what was quite a short speech, said that there were certain challenges which moved on from one government to the next and which had to be seen as critical. And he mentioned three, health, housing, and child poverty. Some people are quite surprised, I think, that he, that Enda Kenny mentioned child poverty. But um, I think uh, from, from our point of view, this was almost the Taoiseach ad advertising today's event. But it's important that uh, a government leader is prepared to highlight th this issue. So this afternoon we have a, a theme which um, I think is quite striking even in its wording. Children of austerity, the Great Recession, and child poverty in rich countries. I was saying to someone we're very much used to on our television screens to see pictures, terrible pictures of children dying in Somalia or Haiti or wherever. But we're talking now about child poverty in, in Dublin, we're talking about child poverty in London. Uh, I was talking to a close relative of mine who works in London saying, I hope in, your dis in this discussion that there will be reference made to the fact that child poverty is a huge issue in the United Kingdom and not least in London. So it's a, it's a big issue and uh, if you're going to discuss a big issue you need the right person to, to do it and I, I, it's a great pleasure uh, to, to welcome Ryan Nolan here to the Institute to talk about this. I was a research professor at the ESRI for a long time, then moved to UCD and moved on now to his position as Professor of Social Policy in Oxford. For a long time he was a great supporter and resource to the Combat Poverty Agency. And I, I, I mentioned to him that I, I got out the book that was produced, I was going to say to celebrate, but to note the abolition of the Combat Poverty Agency. Mm -hmm. And there's a chapter in that book which uh, is written by Stanislaus Kennedy and one or two other people. But there's a quite extraordinary footnote on one page, which refers to eight studies of various aspects of poverty, every one of them by today's speaker, every one of them commissioned by and published by the Combat Poverty Agency. Brian made an enormous contribution to the work of that agency over the years, which I think is acknowledged by anyone who had any dealings with it. So you're, you're more than welcome, and we uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say about what is a, an enormously important and uh, re relevant subject for today and a subject I know a, a huge study that you have been involved in. I see you have the... So let me tell you a little bit about this piece of work. Um, so, so what the report card that UNICEF has released tries to do is, is set 41 rich-ish countries um, in a comparative context in terms of a very broad range of indicators of child well-being. And, and it does a very effective job, and a much, as I was saying at the launch earlier, a very much better job than would have been possible not so long ago in terms of pulling data together that covers such a wide span of uh, indicators related to, to health, to education, to safety, to uh, uh, work, and, and to income and deprivation. What, 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 this, what this book does is uh, it hones in on a, sm a smaller number of countries, on 11 countries, and it tries to look in, uh, at what happened to children through the crisis. And what, what we tried to do, to the extent that we could, and this is a, a study um, uh, sponsored by UNICEF and uh, edited and organised by my, myself and Bea Cantillon, who's a professor in Antwerp, and by two of the UNICEF uh, researchers from their research centre in um, Florence, what, what we pulled together was uh, focused studies of what happened to children through the crisis, what happened to child poverty, um, in 11 countries. And I'm going to talk to you about most of those very quickly now. And what we tried to do was use the same sort of analytical framework to see if we could put them alongside each other 
and find out what was really distinctive about the way the, the recession impacted on children and about the response of policy across as broad a span as we could um, and how, whether that exacerbated or alleviated the immediate impacts of the crisis on, on children. So Ireland is indeed one of the countries covered, but what I want to try and do, and we can go back in the discussion to more about Ireland if, if, if uh, that works, but what I wanted to try and do in ver very briefly was just capture for you the very uh, striking range of experiences across uh, seven or eight countries and what, what do we think was going on? What do we think underpins why child poverty evolved quite so differently across these, across these countries? Now, the, the complicating factor, of course, is how you're trying to measure child poverty and well-being in the first place. And a lot of, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is based on looking at the income of the households the children are living in and looking at measures of material deprivation for those households. Alas, mostly not for the children specifically, but for, for the households, on the presumption that if the, uh, if, if the adults in the household are reporting serious deprivation, that's going to impact on the children. There is some information for some countries specifically about the children, but not enough to do this in a really firm, uh, to compare them in a, in a really firm way. Um, but the preamble has to be about how you measure poverty in terms of income. Because many of us spent many a long year arguing for uh, poverty thresholds to be framed in relative terms. So that if the average or the middle of the distribution moves up, then over time it makes sense to think that people's expectations about what's acceptable, normal, adequate, any of those words, um, that that's going to adjust over time too. So the fact that you're not living, uh, that you don't have to go out the back to an outdoor toilet, uh, you know, that would have been a significant improvement in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but now our standards are very different. And, and that's still, some, that, that, that approach is still uh, an important component of how poverty gets measured. And it gets labeled things like at risk of poverty in European context. Um, but, but of course, that, that wasn't designed to deal with a situation where average income collapses, as it, as it did in some countries in the crisis. So what I'm going to use in talking about income for households with children is what get called anchored poverty thresholds. So that means that you set the poverty threshold in the initial year, and, and as it happens, they're being set vis-a-vis -vis the average in, or the, the middle of the distribution, the median, in the country in question before the crisis, and then they're uprated not in line with the median, because that's very often falling, but in line with prices. So the threshold is retaining its purchasing power. So we're looking at real incomes as they get labelled. So what happens if you look at a bunch of countries uh, and you compare them? So I, I, as I was saying to Tony, I think this is probably a record for me in terms of the number of slides, because I've only got two. So one of them relates to income poverty as I've just defined it. So it's the proportion of children living in households that were below 60% of the median in 2008 and below a similar threshold through these other years indexed to prices, but not to, be, not to the median. And then, just to see if it tells the same story, what happened to the proportion of children who were in households where the adults were reporting severe material deprivation, which again is, a, is an EU measure. Now, uh, let's come back to, uh, sorry, just to make the point that if you measure poverty in the traditional old pre-crisis way, using relative income poverty thresholds, nothing much happened in many of these countries because the threshold adjusted through the crisis. So it's sort of, it's, it's pretty much nothing to see here. Whereas, as you can see here, um, you get very different trajectories across these countries if you use this anchored or real income threshold. Now, I've ordered these, roughly speaking, from best performing to worst performing, with Ireland not ranked at the bottom, but you can make up your own mind about how you think we rank. So just, just to talk through 
what, how, how are these experiences so different and why does Ireland fit where, where it fits? So starting with Sweden, um, you, you will see that there was almost no impact, there was no discernible impact of the crisis on Swedish children in terms of the incomes of their households. And going to the deprivation measures, things improved over this period. Now, that's not because they didn't have a crisis, but they had a very, very uh, quick bounce back. And the Swedish contributors to the book point out that in a sense, they had their crisis in the 1990s, when they had a very severe financial and then economic crisis of pretty much the sort that, that, that we then and, and many other countries experienced in 2008. They had had their crisis. And that's why child poverty in Sweden before the crisis was as high as it is there. You might think, well, it's still the lowest on the table, but it's a heck of a lot higher than it was in Sweden back in the 80s and early 90s. So it jumped up in the crisis that they had in the 90s, but they had bailed out their banks, they didn't make the same mistakes again, and they didn't have the crisis that other countries did. Plus, they had a more resilient social transfer system than many others. Although, interestingly, not as, not as robust and resilient and generous as it had been in the 90s. So they, they, they came out of that crisis with much higher poverty and much weaker social protection than they had had, but that was starting from a, an extremely high base. So what about Germany, though? It's sort of interesting in that uh, Germany doesn't have that level of social protection that, that Sweden does, and yet we see no impact. So how, how, did, how did they manage that? And let's just check that on the deprivation measure, again, things actually improved rather than got worse through the crisis. So what's, what's, what's the trick in that case? Well, there were two, two key components. And sorry, I should say, this is in a context where the social protection system there has also been weakened in recent years, more recently than in Sweden. But as, as a result of reforms that Gerhard Schroeder now gets blamed for, as opposed to uh, he used to get the credit for, um, he gets blamed for the reforms in the early to mid-2000s uh, that uh, flexibilized the labor market and weakened social protection. But despite that, income poverty and deprivation went down, measured this way. So the two, two crucial ingredients were fiscal stimulus and job sharing. In, in a very structured way, as many of you know, the, the German, the large unions and employers, with very substantial encouragement and subsidization from the state, essentially um, introduced highly structured part-time working to get through the crisis. So unemployment didn't rise. So if unemployment doesn't rise and incomes are boosted, uh, so your employment hours might fall, you don't become unemployed, and there's some compensation for the state, both for the employer and for the employee, to, to fill the gap. Um, again, nothing, nothing very much in, in the way of an impact on poverty. But not because they didn't have a crisis, but because when the crisis happened, they did something about it, both in terms of macroeconomic stimulus and in terms of labour market intervention. And they have a pretty robust social transfer system. Not as good as it used to be, or as Sweden, but pretty robust. Belgium, a rather similar story. I won't go into it. Again, no, nothing, no, no increase in poverty or deprivation much. Um, and a combination of fiscal stimulus and uh, some job sharing and protection of employment mm -hmm. through the crisis and uh, a boosting of social transfers to, to, to fill the gap for the rest. Now, the UK then is, is you, could, you could argue about whether you want um, to put the UK or the US next in the ranking for reasons that I'll come to. But if you look at the UK, um, perhaps surprisingly, and I think it was <laughs> perhaps surprisingly for the authors of the chapter in the book, um, the, you don't see a sharp uptick in income-based poverty for children in the UK up to 2015. Now, if I could do this right, you, you do see a jump up in deprivation. That, that's hard to unpick, though, because, unfortunately, they changed the survey. 
So these European numbers should come with a health warning that you don't often get enough attention paid to that says break in the series. It's in this very small print in the footnotes, but they switched from one survey to another uh, in the gap between 2008 and 2012, and I think that's significantly responsible for that, that jump. Um, and that's, that's partly because, again, at the onset of the crisis, there was a substantial fiscal, st fiscal stimulus for which the uh, Labour government didn't get much credit from the voters, but which did help to stave off the worst effects of the crisis. And the while unemployment went up, it, it came down again reasonably fast and was mostly concentrated, or was more, more heavily concentrated in, in those who didn't have children. Um, so you didn't have quite the impact in the UK that I think analysts had been expecting. Now there's lots and lots and lots of health warnings about this in the sense that what the um, coalition government and then but more particularly the uh, David Cameron Tory government had, had started into was a, a series of welfare cuts that were projected to have very marked negative effects on households with children. And that if you look at projections for this going five years uh, into the future, you, you get really big increases in child poverty. Because effectively, they, they, have, they, they cut some of the welfare rates and froze the rest so that they would not be indexed as prices went up. Sterling has fallen because of Brexit, so prices are going up a lot more than had been anticipated. And one of the big challenges for the current government is whether they can walk away or ease that austerity. But interestingly, even the Labour manifesto didn't say it was going to tackle this. They were, they, they, it, was, it was in some sense the, the, the dog that didn't bark, the promise they didn't make was to index welfare rates and not, not have this um, austerity focused very specifically on working age uh, rather than pensioner uh, welfare recipients. So what about the US? The US is sort of interesting in that I think if you had started, or probably when we started into this as a collaborative exercise, um, your usual presumption is you're used to seeing the US at, at the high end of all these rankings, mm -hmm. as they feature in the, at the high end of the UNICEF report card. You're used to thinking that the US is going to do worst on anything to do with poverty. But it doesn't. Um, poverty, not measured the way it gets measured in the US, which is a very specific way, they, have, they are unusual in having a long-standing national poverty measure, uh, which is a good thing, but it's a very odd measure, uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it has all sorts of flaws in it. Um, if if the, the researchers who, who did the US chapter in this book tried to measure poverty the way it's measured in these European countries, and this is the best they could come up with, that there was a fairly modest uptick from, from a very high level, a very modest uptick in poverty in the US at the onset of the crisis. Now, that it's, it's, it's stayed up, but, uh, and they don't have deprivation measures of the sort that we have in, for European countries. So what, what, what happened there? If they, if, they're, if they have such a patchy and poor welfare system, as we tend to think they have, how come poverty, child poverty didn't go up a lot more? Well, again, two reasons. <coughs> One is fiscal stimulus, and again, Obama is another, another politician who doesn't get enough credit for the fiscal stimulus that made all the difference to the impact of the crisis. Um, but also, they, they intervened to adapt the welfare system temporarily for the scale of the increase in unemployment that, that occurred despite the fiscal stimulus. So, crucially, um, welfare entitlements tend to be low but they got extended, your, in, your, in, your social insurance entitlement uh, got extended in, in a number of steps so that uh, essentially those who were affected could float through with some level of support, and certainly much higher than would have been on a, on a pure means-tested basis. They could get insurance-related payments to get through a period of unemployment, and then the economy started recovering and unemployment started coming down. So they're, they're the countries where I think you could say um, child poverty on either the basis of income or deprivation, um, given that this was the biggest recession since the 1930s, 
Um, these, these countries proved pretty resilient. Um, so now we go on to, in some sense, the other half, um, where, where we see countries that really did much less well. So these are, these are countries that were certainly much more seriously damaged economically by the crisis, um, including bank bailouts, of course. Um, so the decline in GDP per head in these countries, so we're talking about Spain, Greece, uh, and I could have Italy on here as well, um, Spain, Greece, Italy, and Ireland, they took a bigger hit, but the impact was much more pronounced uh, in terms of child poverty. So you see pretty sizable increases against this real income measure, where in Spain, child poverty is going from 27 to 38%, and in Greece, calamitously, from 23 to 56, and in Ireland, initially, from 18 to 28. So that's a very big increase. And more or less, you see a, a similar um, pattern for deprivation-based measures, where you see um, very substantial increases for Spain and Greece. Greece, go, now it's gone up two and a half times. Um, and, and this is, I should say, this is, this is what the EU labeled severe material deprivation. So th this, is, this is not um, in any sense uh, to be taken lightly. And in Ireland, interestingly, what you see is, as with the income-based measure, you see an initial sharp rise, a doubling, um, but, but by 2015, a substantial decline. So that's where, obviously, Ireland is very different to Spain, Greece, or Italy, which I just didn't put on there. So in, 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 in Spain and Italy, uh, things pretty much kept getting worse until very recently, um, as, as this shows, and have only started to improve in Spain in the last nine months or a year, and haven't really started to improve in Italy. And in Greece, they're getting worse and worse. Um, in Ireland, that's not the case. Things have been getting better as economic growth picked up and employment started to fall, and they're continuing to get better. And uh, the, while these are the latest comparative numbers that we have, um, national numbers suggest that this improvement has continued to happen. So, so why, why has Ireland done, I'll wrap up quite quickly, why has Ireland done much less well than what you might call the top half of the table, but rather better in, in recovery than the uh, Mediterranean countries? I think, I think two, two, two uh, central reasons. Um, wh one is the robustness of the social transfer system, which you know, gets ranked by the OECD and the EU as among the most effective in addressing immediate declines in income. Now, that doesn't mean it's particularly generous, but it does mean that there aren't a lot of holes in it, and that when, when, you, when you lose your job, crucially, uh, the uh, transfer system is there to support the household. And not, not very many fall through the cracks. I mean, there were some, there were some specific types of households that, that became obvious during the crisis as potentially falling through the cracks. But compared to the Mediterranean countries, we have a pretty universal and comprehensive system. And that brings out that, that these, these countries, Italy, Spain, um, Portugal, and Greece, have highly patchy, underdeveloped, um, ineffective social transfer systems. Not only are there lots of holes in them, but uh, where, where, where they're generous, they're very generous. So. It's not, it's not even that there's, there's holes and a generally low base. There's, a, there's an allocation that makes no sense in terms of where the money is being spent versus where the need is. So these, these gaps are much bigger than the gaps you would see if you were comparing social expenditure levels uh, because the money isn't spent very sensibly. Now, the, so some, some, many of these countries have been very seriously trying to address this and improve their social transfer systems. But of course, trying to do that in the teeth of a deep recession is enormously difficult. Um, and it's, it's in some sense surprising they've made the progress that they've made. Um, but the other reason why Ireland is different, of course, is that we've had a recovery that they haven't had. 
um, that, that we've now had very rapid economic growth for three or four years, and unemployment has come very significantly down. Um, and that took the pressure, that has served to take the pressure off the social transfer system. Um, and that's just not the case uh, in those other countries, and it's particularly not the case in Greece. And um, I, I should have marked the page, but my, my Greek colleague um, has, has a heartfelt uh, statement in the Greek chapter along the lines of, um, if, 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 if any other country had had to cope with the decline in income that Greece has had to cope with, it wouldn't have mattered how developed their social transfer system was. It just would have been swamped. And I think that's absolutely true. And, and in some sense, while Ireland is a very interesting case and one we're particularly interested in, if you were to come away with one message from this book, it's uh, that Greece is, I mean, you just, you just have to look at, at these deprivation numbers. Uh, the, 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 these, this is severe deprivation for households with children. Now, I mean, as, as I stop, you might like to look at the top line there and see just how low deprivation is for households with children in Sweden, despite the fact that their income poverty rate is significantly higher than it was. But the gulf between um, Sweden and Greece is, is in some sense the big picture message from this, um, apart from our, our local concerns, if you like.